Hello and welcome to today's Daily Bible Reading. If you're counting, today is actually day 147, getting closer and closer to the middle of the year. So if you've been tracking with me since day one, great effort, well done. Um, a lot has changed in our world if you're tracking with me as these come out. Uh, I know that these will be uploaded and archived for years to come, but right now we're really in the grip of the coronavirus lockdown, the, the pandemic that's uh, blighting the world, particularly the United States. So my heart, and I'm, I'm sure yours does as well, heart and prayers go out to our cousins in the United States of America who are suffering horribly at, at, with this pandemic. Let's pray. We're continuing in 2 Kings and also in the book of Acts. Father, thank you so much for the gift of your word and I pray, Lord, that as we read your word, you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This is 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favour, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valour, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord. Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? He has actually said to you, Wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. From now on, your servant will not offer burnt offerings or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. In this matter... May the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there leaning on my arm and I bow myself in the house of Rimon when I bow myself in the house of Rimon. The Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared this name in the Syrian in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman 
And when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me to say, There have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. And Naaman said, Be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags and two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house. And he sent the men away and they departed. He went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, Did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. This is a really dramatic story. It's a dramatic story of, of pride. Firstly, the pride of Naaman, not prepared to go into the River Jordan because he felt, well, if God wanted me to go into a river, surely he would have sent me into a nicer river. And if you've ever seen pictures of the Jordan, I've not been there myself, but I've seen video footage of it and I've seen pictures of it today. It's not an attractive river, that, especially that part of it is really not attractive. So I can understand if that's how it was in Naaman's day, that's probably his impression as well. This is not a nice river. And yet it took pride for him, as his servant said to him, to acknowledge, well, if this is what he's asking, this is what I'll do. I think salvation is like that too. Sometimes we think we have to do something great or outstanding in order to earn our salvation. But it takes humility to accept that there is a saviour and our salvation only comes from turning to him. That takes tremendous pride, the sacrificing of pride takes tremendous humility because we want to contribute, we want some credit in this, but there's none to be had. We cannot save ourselves. It's an act of humility to say we need a saviour because we can't do it. The next act of pride was Gehazi, just wanting greed, this, this greed that he felt that he deserved something, which is essentially pride as well. And he gets called out and pays a horrible price for it. So we're seeing in this era of the prophet how God vindicated the words of the prophet. And we, we also get the impression that the prophet is waiting on God for direction and then gives that direction as well. Let's come now, next chapter, this is uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, each of us, get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, Take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. Once, when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, No, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. 
So he sent their horses and chariots, a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria as they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. Now as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the winepress? And the king said to her, What is your trouble? She answered, this woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we shall eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And on the next day I said to her, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath on his body. And he said, May God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. Now the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door fast against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still speaking with them, the messenger came down to him and said, This trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Oh, wow. So we, we, we leave this almost like a TV serial in that, oh, what's going to happen? Well, we'll have to find out tomorrow. And we're seeing, the rise, as I said, the rise of the prophet. And here we have the typical uh, response of people to the prophet and that is usually to blame him and this was such a typical thing and Elisha was was experiencing it as well. We saw in that passage how Elisha showed grace to the army of Syria and how under that king uh, presumably they, they never raided that area again because they were shown kindness. There's a, there's a clue I think for international diplomacy. We come now into the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, and if, if you thought that everything was rosy in the earliest church, you probably won't think so once you read this along with me. So let's have a look now. This is Acts chapter 5. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? 
and after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, uh, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Well, as you would think, I mean, this is extraordinary. The, um, people uh, refer to being slain in the spirit. This was being slain in the spirit. These, these people fell forward, they fell down, they fell dead. And they did that because essentially Peter has said, if you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit like this, the, the agent of Christ's salvation, what hope is there? And so the answer is none. And so it's a, an incredible act. And it should cause us to have pause to think, let's not trifle with the things of God. And the early church lived with a, with a sense of the fear of the Lord, that God was incredibly gracious, incredibly loving, but incredibly holy, not one to be trifled with. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. We see here that there was a very strong position taken on promoting the holiness of God, that God's not to be trifled with. And while some today might think we have to be relevant and tone down the gospel, here there was no toning it down. And you note, that, that the result was that the people held them in high esteem, so they respected them greatly, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord. So let's be careful that we're not compromising ourselves into irrelevancy by trying to be relevant at the expense of promoting the true and the real gospel. Um, boy, there's, there's principles here to learn. And I said right from the start as we looked at Acts, that, that Dr. Luke is giving us teaching principles for the church. So we continue on. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now, when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. 
But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honour by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, The men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Wow. Notice there uh, that they weren't afraid. They weren't afraid of what the religious leaders of their day could do to them. And we're going to see this pattern all through Acts now. In fact, we're going to see it all through church history from this point on. A fearlessness, a boldness. I think it was Tacitus, the Roman historian, who later wrote, we can't do anything to them because they don't fear death. They see death as their entrance into eternal life. And so there's nothing we can do to dissuade them. Wow. <laughs> That's a great witness and it should encourage us also to be bold and not afraid. Don't be afraid. And so right at the end, I find this amazing. that They counted it worthy that they could suffer for Christ. Wow, what a completely different perspective. May we also count it worthy if we suffer because of our faith in Christ. Again, uh, we, we see that they, the, the, the advice given by Gamaliel, leave them alone. If God's in it, there's nothing you can do. You might even be fighting against God. And those words were proved to be very true. Gamaliel, of course, was the teacher of the Apostle Paul, which is an interesting link. One of the biblical uh, uh, patterns here is a character is introduced so that he's under, his role is understood later. All right, this is Acts chapter 6. Now in those days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. All right, Hellenists, oh, we just need to explain this. The, the, the Greece was known as Helen. To be a Greek was to be uh, of Helen. Now it sounds like a woman's name, but it was actually... a. Helen was actually a Greek hero. He was a man. And so the whole country was, was known as Helen. And so uh, to be a Hellenist is to be a Greek. It meant that your primary language, your mother tongue was Greek. And uh, you were probably from a region where the only language you spoke was Greek. To be a Hebrew was to have spoken Aramaic because the, the original Hebrew language had kind of morphed into this language known as Aramaic, which was spoken in that, in that whole Semitic region. Semitic, um, that we, we might talk about that later. So these Hellenists are Greek-speaking, Greek-thinking, former Jews who've now converted to Christianity. That's what a Hellenist is. And they're complaining that they're getting the raw end of the deal here, that, it, that there was a bit of racism happening here because the Hebrews were getting a better deal than they were. So let's pick it up again, verse 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, 
It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. All right, I uh, need to just make a comment here because each of these seven men who are generally referred to as deacons, which simply means servants, diakonos, they, they are, or diakonoi in this instance, they are servants. They, they are there just to, to serve. And that's what a, the word deacon uh, literally minister or servant means. Now, here's the other thing to note. Each of these names are Greek names. They're not Hebrew names. So in other words, the people chosen to minister to the Greek Christians were people, men, who were Greek themselves, if not, if not a Greek-thinking former Jews, Greek-speaking, Greek-thinking. Uh, the Greeks had a way of thinking. So... So there we, there we have that. And the other thing to, to note here is that the apostles didn't appoint them. They, they actually put it to the people. Now, this is called congregationalism. In other words, when, when the congregation can, can appoint people to fill a role, that's, that's congregational government. But it's not just congregational government because the people selected the people and brought those names of these men to the apostles and the apostles affirmed them. So that's called apostolic leadership. So we see two types of government working cooperatively together in the early church. Now, I mention this because some people only read through the filter of congregational government when they read the New Testament, and others only read through the filter of apostolic leadership when they read the New Testament, and I think it's worthwhile knowing that there was an interaction in the early church. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So as the church restructured and appointed another layer of leadership, the church grew because it had the framework to grow. So in order for a church, any church to grow, there has to be delegation of responsibility there has to be people who are qualified. Note that these men were full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit and they were clearly familiar with the Word of God. So there's a depth of maturity there as well that, that added to that leadership. We continue on, verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Okay, so one of these, we'll call them deacons, uh, they're not referred to as, as deacons in, in the text here, but they're referred to as servants or ministers. Um, Stephen, he's, he's preaching, and he's preaching in a very convincing way. And this is how we know he was, that he, among the others, were well and truly grounded in the Word. He's publicly challenged about what he's saying about Jesus, and he's able to defend it. He's able to give reason, and he's able to do it with wisdom it says they couldn't refute his wisdom so anyone who wants to fulfill the role of a deacon in a church 
Really, this is the pattern. This is the model. They have to be familiar with God's word, filled with the Holy Spirit, and a person who demonstrates wisdom in how they practice their Christianity. So there's some lessons for us today. And if you aspire to a leadership position in the church, they're the three things to be praying about and asking God to help you with. And if you're doing this daily Bible reading, you're ticking off at least one of the, the, the requirements to be someone familiar with God's word. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we see why humility is important in the story of Naaman and Gehazi. We see how diplomacy and seeking to be a peacemaker is important as we saw how Elisha led the Syrian army into Samaria and showed them grace. And Lord, we see in the book of Acts that you are a holy God, even though some people have the idea that you as a God of grace are actually soft on sin. We see that you're not. You're actually a holy God. And Lord, we see the qualities of leadership required today in the church exhibited uh, profoundly by Stephen. And I pray that my life would reflect these traits as well, to be a person familiar with the word of God, full of, the, full of the Holy Spirit and filled with wisdom as well. And I pray, Lord, for all those who join with me now in this Bible reading, that they too will be filled with the Holy Spirit today. They will be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit today. And that, Lord, they will receive wisdom for the decisions they have to make today that come from you, informed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this daily Bible reading. Please, if you haven't yet given it a thumbs up, please give it a thumbs up. If you're not yet a subscriber, please subscribe. And I'll see you tomorrow. Pray next. Go.